It's time for Football at Four with 97.3 ESPN.com's Andrew DeCecco. My first allegiance is what will be best for the Philadelphia Eagles and our fans for the next three, four, five years. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Josh Eddick filling in for Mike Kelly here, Football at Four. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, the latest edition with Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan, dropped this morning. You can go check it out. A lot's going on this week in the NFL. A lot of moves, a lot of shaking, and how it impacts the Eagles and more right now. As promised, football at 4 at 5 p.m. with Andrew Checo right now on the Boardwalk kind of Hotline. Football at 4 being brought to you by Dr. Lyle M. Back for everything from skincare to cosmetic surgery. Go to ilovelyleback.com or call 856-MAKEOVER for Dr. Lyle M. Back, proud sponsor of Football at four. Andrew, welcome in to football at four at five. How you doing? I'm doing well, Josh. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. You know, it's a crazy world we live in. We're just kind of like maneuvering around everything that's going on out there with college basketball. We got to talk Eagles because Andrew, it's been a very interesting weekend. I want to start with the wide receivers because mm-hmm. there's a huge wide receiver class out there. And listen, the draft is going to have three, if you include Kyle Pitts, four top tier receivers in the draft. And then you look at the receivers who are in free agency, Kenny Galladay, Juju Smith-Schuster. So how do you think that the free agents could impact the draft and vice versa at the wide receiver position? Well, it's certainly going to impact it. I mean, Juju is incredibly young and it hasn't it has yet to hit his stride of what he can accomplish. I mean, I think that it put him in a different system where he can be a surefire number one his it's really going to his, his skill set is really going to shine um and then Kenny Galladay Kenny Galladay is another player that that he's like a piece like a team that needs uh one final piece you're going to look at a guy like Kenny Galladay because he's a red zone option he's he's a little bit older uh than Juju but I mean he's he's an immense talent and he's they're gonna he's gonna command a lot of money on the open market neither of those guys are burners obviously so they're not going to you know yield as much on the open market because that's a that's a skill set that tends to, you know, garner a lot more of a, of a higher price tag. But I mean, it's going to impact the draft a little bit regardless because you have two top guys there and um, we'll see what happens at the top of the draft. When you think about those receivers you just mentioned, how do those guys stack up versus the guys in the draft? Because we all know some teams, they might, not, they might not want to take a risk on a receiver, but they might also say that, for example, a Chase or a Smith or a Waddle might be better than who they can get in free agency, right? Yeah, also from a cost perspective as well. I mean, the Eagles don't need a possession guy such as a Kenny Galladay or a Juju. What they need is some more speed to add another layer to that offense, and they're going to have a couple of options there at the top of the draft, it's going to have an interesting decision to see whether they go the route of a Jamar Chase, uh, a Waddle, a Devontae Smith, or even possibly a Kyle Pitts. But I think that getting those guys, you know, on a, on a rookie contract versus adding a, a veteran player who doesn't really fit what the Eagles doesn't really fit a need. They don't, they have their possession guys. They got a Travis Fulgham. You have JJ Arcega Whiteside. So you're going to see if he's able to develop with under the tutelage of Sirianni, Kevin Petullo, um, and Aaron Moorhead. So, I mean, I would definitely look at wide receiver at, at number six and, and go that route. Any interest at all in maybe T.Y. Hilton on a one-year deal? Uh, I mean, for very little. I, for, I don't know how much he's going to command on the open market, but I have to think that he'll, he would get a better offer elsewhere. I don't know how much the Eagles are really going to have to offer him. Also, he at his stage of his career, he probably wants to go to a contender, I would think. So, the Eagles are going to about to embark on a three-year rebuild. Um, so I don't know how enticing that's going to be for a, a veteran free agent such as T.Y. Andrew DeCecco joining us here on the Boardwalk kind of Hotline here on the Sports Bash with 97.3 ESPN. Again, follow him on Twitter at A. DeCecco NFL. Of course, we're talking about the Eagles here. Football at 4 at 5 p.m. today because of college basketball here on 97.3 ESPN. Andrew Obviously, the salary cap came out this week, $182.5 million. And I mentioned this to Jeff Mosher yesterday. I want to get your thoughts on this. That's still about $16 million less than what it was last year. 
is there a part of you that thinks if the salary cap was the same as it was last year or more, that maybe certain things would be different? Because it's not just the Eagles who are having problems. We saw the Chiefs have to cut both of their starting tackles yeah. from their Super Bowl wins. So you're talking about two of the top tackles in the league going on the free agent market. So it's not just the Eagles. The entire league is having to reshuffle the deck because of this salary cap situation. Yeah, and, and this is something that we kind of anticipated last summer with given everything that was kind of materializing. That I just didn't think it was going to be this drastic, Josh. I mean, you're seeing not just the Eagles affected by this, but you mentioned, my gosh, the Chiefs having the part with both their tackles. And it's just all over the NFL, teams are just having to shed uh, shed some excess uh, shed players to, you know, get under and meet a certain, you know, a number. And that's unfortunate because, I mean, in, in an ordinary off season, this wouldn't be the case, but I mean, I didn't think it was going to be this drastic. I, I thought that there'd be, I, I always thought there were going to be a handful of teams that were affected by it. I just didn't think that it was going to be league wide. Now we know the Eagles, they restructured two more contracts, here they have restructured Javon Hargrave. They restructured Isaac Sayamalu. Um, obviously, it's good to see that there are guys who are willing to do the restructures because it does save the team money, and it shows that they want to be here as well. What are your thoughts on the, the – it's become a list now. You know, you got Kelsey. You got Slay. You got Sayamalu. You got Hargrave. We know that Lane Johnson said he's willing to restructure. We know that Brandon Graham says, I'll do whatever it takes to stay in the Eagles uniform. I'll restructure. What is your thought on the willingness of all these guys to just say, listen, you need to work the contract, you need to work the numbers, I'm game because I want to be here? Well, I think it speaks to the culture that's kind of been in that locker room for a number of years. I mean, despite the, the chatter and the, and the stories that have come out about that, I do think that people like being here. Brandon Graham um, put that very nicely. I believe it was it was recently, and – it's obvious when you see all these guys willing to kind of accommodate the Eagles and restructure, you know, for the greater good of the team. And these guys want to be here. They want to finish what they started. Um, it speaks of their character and their commitment to the football team. And, you know, after seeing everything that's kind of transpired in, in that regard, I think that answers a lot of questions as far as the toxicity, the, the rumors of toxicity and that throwing around the Novacare uh, complex and things like that. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't know if you have an answer for this, and I don't think there really is a right answer to this. So, but where do you think these rumors come from about the the problems and the toxicity and the the, the things that are out there? Because I feel like sometimes stuff starts up on social media and it doesn't really come from anywhere legitimate. It just becomes propagated because enough people say it, retweet it, share it, like mm -hmm. it. You know what I mean? Well, there are, you know, certain factors that would lead people to believe that there would be. I mean, taking a quarterback in the second round like Jalen Hurts is going to cause a little bit of turmoil, be it large or small. If you're Carson Wentz in that situation, there's going to be a little bit of, of tension there, certainly. And I think that when you look, you're going to look at every little thing that they do. Are, are they communicating on the sideline? This, that, and the other thing. When they took Hurts out of the game and um, and and in the Washington game, they're looking for body language. They're looking for you know any little reason to kind of you know incite some sort of uh, you know rage over over certain things. And I think a lot of it is is kind of um, it's kind of over exaggerated. And unfortunately, every everyone in that locker room has looked under a microscope, so they look for any little thing to attach it to. But I don't necessarily think that outside of that Carson Wentz situation. Yeah, there was there there were issues, but I don't know that they were as large as you know as many you know believe that it was. I mean, there's certainly issues there, but and he's no longer here. But um, I don't think there was as much drama swirling around that building as as many were led to believe. Couldn't I argue, just play devil's advocate, that every team has issues except for the team that wins the Rubble every year, right? Like every team has mm -hmm. something they got to deal with. So I, I don't, I just. I'm trying to understand a little bit better because I feel like sometimes I jump on social media, Andrew, I read an article and I see the reactions under the article or under a post, like over at insidethebirds.com or 973espn.com or on your Twitter or Mosher or Kaplan. And I feel like yeah. it's like, I'm just trying to understand where some of this is coming from. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's a lot of negativity on social media. That's why I, 
I get in there, I put my article out, and I kind of scoot out these days <laughs> because, it, you know, it's, it's just not very productive. And, it's not, you know, you're seeing a lot of the same arguments every single day. And I don't know where the hostility is coming from. I mean, the Eagles are in a great position to improve the football team in the draft. There's a lot to look forward to with the new regime. Um, I mean, I, I think everyone just needs to approach the offseason with an open mind. Every, not everyone's going to share the same viewpoints, but I mean, uh, to answer your question, I mean, I'm going to, I'm kind of dumbfounded myself. I don't know why it's necessarily such a hostile place, but, uh, but it is. And hopefully, you know, the, a, a good draft and a productive off season will kind of, will kind of, you know, uh, dissipate that a little bit. Andrew Checo here, football and forward power by the Inside the Birds podcast. Speaking of Adam Kaplan and Jeff Mosher, the latest episode with them dropped this morning at 6 a.m., Andrew, what dropped yesterday was the Q&A podcast, the second episode, and they dove even deeper into the wide receiver situation. And one of the things they brought up was Jalen Rager. And Jason Avon, who was with the team last year, who said that he said that Rager has the most dog in him of anybody on the team, that he gets personally offended when people bring up Justin Jefferson. There's that part of him that he thinks that he has the highest ceiling of all the young receivers on the team. I want to get your reaction to that because – you were evaluating him all through the draft process mm-hmm. before he got drafted. And now, Vaughn, who wasn't evaluating him in the draft, but he's saying on the other side of the coin, I was with this guy with the Eagles this past year, and this is what I see from him. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I would certainly hope that he has the highest upside considering he was a first-round pick. But I, 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 to a degree, I, I agree with what Jason said. Um, but, you know, there, when I was evaluating him for the draft, one thing that I didn't particularly – you know, care for was sometimes the body language wasn't great. If the, if things weren't necessarily going his way, as far as, I mean, he had a really inaccurate quarterback in college, but you need to, at being a, a, a leader, you need to lead by example. And it's all about positive body language and um, making the most of your opportunities. He dropped the football a lot. I like to, I look to see how he would respond from that. And, you know, not a lot of times it wasn't always necessarily positive, but, and, and he talked about the, having a chip on his shoulder every time Justin Jefferson's brought up. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think that he should because he's here and Justin Jefferson's not. This is, you know, he's a Philadelphia Eagle and people are talking about somebody who's no, no longer, I mean, isn't a member of the franchise. But he needs to control what he can control, go on the field and make plays when the ball's thrown in his direction. He has, a lot, he has a long way to go as a route runner. He needs to um, just become more proficient in the in the route tree and be more aware when he's running his routes. He tends to squeeze the sideline a little bit. Uh, you don't see a lot of you didn't see you know Justin Jefferson or rookies do that. So when you make these kind of mistakes, they're going to also they're always going to harken back in. You know Justin Jefferson was there, um, and he was more he was more of a polished product. But I mean he just needs to have that mindset through the off season that he's he knows the player that he is. He's comfortable in who he is. And he's going to uh, take that next step, and hopefully that quiets a lot of that chatter. And you don't have really have he doesn't have to hear that anymore. I made the argument yesterday, Andrew. You tell me what you think of this. I felt like I think people with their perspective on Jefferson is a little exaggerated as well because Jefferson walked into a, an ideal situation, and he had what was it, 124 targets last year. The guy with the most targets on the Eagles last year was 79 with Greg Ward. So right you have a situation where Kirk Cousins outplayed Carson Wentz last year. You had an offense that literally was telling Jefferson, you, you're, you're basically filling the void of Stephon Diggs when it comes to targets. I don't think Jefferson has that kind of production. I'm not saying he's going to be a bad receiver, but I just look at him when he did in Minnesota, and I look at him and say, I just don't see that guy doing that here with the Eagles last year. Well, well, that's fair to say, but he, he's a volume receiver, Justin Jefferson. He's a more polished route runner. Um, he's, he has great spatial awareness, good body control, can make those tough contested catches. And, you know, coming out, there was no question that he was the more, you know, NFL-ready player. And he, there are different types of players because he's a guy that you can force feed the ball to, and he's going to be a chain mover. He can work all three la- levels of the field, but that's, that's not necessarily – his strength, he's not a burner by any means, but I mean, I think if you plugged him in on a lot of offenses, he would have been just as productive because he knows how to find the soft spots in zone. He has sure hands and he's, he's, he's a very, he was really savvy for a rookie and that really stuck out to me, but um, I don't know if he would have had quite the prolific rookie season that he had with Minnesota, but I mean, you put him on the Eagles and he's going to have a markedly better season than Jalen Rager had. Another thing they brought up on the Q and a 
Pod, episode two on Wednesday morning that dropped was, we've talked numerous times about on football at four, about Travis Fulgham. Burst onto the scene, has a great few games, and then it just kind of like got phased out. And Jason Avant came out and said, the Eagles, we as an organization was the quote, stunted Travis's growth with indecision. And that's from a guy who was in the building. So I want to get your reaction to that. Avant saying that the Eagles stunted Travis's growth last year. That's another thing that was apparent because it, it, there was it was it was the oddest thing. You don't just put together those four games of of that high level of play and just kind of disappear. And you all of a sudden you're a non sack and you suddenly can't play anymore. You can't see the field. I think the return of Alshon Jeffrey certainly impacted that. And it's, I think that bringing in when Jalen Hurts took over, he didn't quite have the same rapport with Travis that Carson Wentz had. I think that also played a part in that, but um, he just, he, he, I think they really wanted to get Alshon into the offense. And it's unfortunately it took a lot of snaps away from Travis. Of course, you also saw those practice habits of, of Travis Fulgham that were questioned um, or late in the season, you saw you started to hear some of those rumors. That could have played into it a little bit, I suppose, but I think it just had more so to do with the Eagles not really prioritizing getting a younger player on the field and getting him maximizing his reps and opportunities and really going back to you know the wily old veteran and trying to make it work when it obviously wasn't working, and you know he wasn't going to be here for the long haul. Speaking of wide receivers, you wrote over at InsideTheBirds.com. You were answering a mailbag on different – questions about the draft and you have on the site you have waddle over smith of the alabama receivers your full Mm -hmm. list of ranking them was pitts chase waddle smith i want to focus on specifically waddle and smith i'm glad you brought this up because one of the things you talk about is the frame of these guys how they're built and that's my biggest concern with devonta smith when i heard he was not willing to weigh in at the senior bowl that concerned me, and I wasn't the only yeah. one who was concerned. And people keep saying, oh, well, he's like Marvin Harrison. Let me tell you something. Marvin Harrison was 181 pounds before he was drafted. You're talking about a guy in Smith who was, they listed him at 175, but we all know in football terms, they make you weigh a little bit more, and they make you a little bit taller. So I'm pr- pretty sure that Smith is probably a little smaller than even yeah. he's listed. Yeah, and, you know, going back to Marvin Harrison, Marvin Harrison is one of the greatest receivers to ever play the game. But when he faced corners that were very that were physical and tough, like a Ty Law when, in those championship games, well, he was sort of a non-factor. You, have, you eventually have to be able to go against these tougher physical corners. And when I look at someone with the build of a Devontae Smith, you know, it, it's, it's tough to kind of figure how he – can be an every down player or play a full slate of games in the NFL with that type of frame. Yeah. He made a living in college. He was known as being a tough, you know, a tough receiver who's willing to go across the middle and make these tough catches and not afraid to not afraid of contact. That's fine. But when you're looking at the pro level, there's a lot more that goes into it. You're not just going to be able to run it, run free, you know, and, and then through a secondary. And I mean, there's going, you're going to face some challenges. You're going to face a lot of physical defensive backs, and you're not just going to have, you know, that free reign to do whatever you want out there in the open field. So when I look at him and Waddle, Waddle has a has a much better frame to be a to be a receiver that's going to be a starter and they can hold up for kind of withstand the rigors of a full season. And I, and he's also way more explosive. So I think if you look at what he can bring to the table, pair him with Jalen Rager, all of a sudden the Eagles have a pretty dynamic offense. What is also special about Waddle to you as terms of receiver? Because I didn't see him much last year because of the injury. So you're kind of going off right. of a little bit of last year, but also more of the year before where he was playing alongside Judy and Ruggs. So what do you see in Waddle's game that makes you think he could be so good in the NFL? The suddenness in his route running, the ability to stretch teams vertically, run the affect all three levels of the field. He's not a limited player by any means. He's a home run guy. And I just think that what, when you look at what the Eagles offense needs, they need speed and they need a player who can be not, not just a, not just a, a guy who can, you know, a role player. They need somebody that can be out there and be a starter, be an impact player. I don't know if Devonte Smith can be that in the NFL. I'm not saying he can't, but in my opinion right now, when you're looking at the two players side by side, if you're the Eagles, I think you have to go Jalen Waddle for that very reason, because you know 
looking at his skill set, looking at his build, I think that he he's really what the Eagles need right now. The full Eagles draft Q&A is up at InsideTheBirds.com. He is Andrew DeCecco. You can follow him on Twitter at NFL. Of course, he covers the Eagles as well as the NFL draft, and he joins us each week here on Football at Four. He'll be back on Tuesday here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN at the usual 4 o'clock time. Football at Four will be back at 4 o'clock next week. But we appreciate you, Andrew, jumping on at a different time on the Boardwalk kind of hotline. Not a problem, Josh. Have a great weekend. Of course, Football at Four being brought to you by Dr. Lyle M. Back for everything from skin care to cosmetic surgery. Go to ilovelyleback.com. Call 856-MAKEOVER for Dr. Lyle M. Back, proud sponsor of Football at Four.